Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Lauren Nixon. I'm a PhD researcher from the Center for the History of the Gothic, which is part of the university's English department. So I'm going to be talking to you today about why we study Gothic. And in fact, a lot of that is going to be explaining what Gothic is in a way of explaining why we study it. Okay, so first of all, what do we mean when we say Gothic? And perhaps many of you, when we say Gothic, these are the kind of images that comes to mind. It's skulls, ravens, vampires, but it's also castles and abbeys and arches. And it's also weekends in Whitby and it's films and it's dresses, but it's also uh, ancient German barbarians for some of you. And I'll explain why. So really to look at why we study the Gothic, why the Gothic's important, we have to see where this terminology comes from and how it comes to encompass all of the things that we think of it today. So these are our barbarous Goths. So the bar these are the barbarians around about third to sixth century Germany. Uh, some of you, if you've studied ancient Roman history, might already be aware of these. Particularly the two branches that we're thinking about are the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths. Now they are partially responsible for the fall of Rome, the fall of man's greatest civilization. And this is where that barbaric aspect of Gothic comes from, which you might not think of as being a part of Gothic today, but actually this is the important founding factor. The Gothic is barbaric, Goth is barbarous. Gothic as a term for art, for architecture, for literature, starts to come about in the Renaissance, but it actually refers back to the medieval period. And particularly, it means bad art. The Gothic is a form that, when the Renaissance comes about and into the 17th and early 18th century, when we start to get neoclassicism, is aesthetically displeasing, or it's frivolous. It uses the supernatural. There's too many giants and fairies. It's not the kind of thing that post-Enlightenment Britain wants to have in their art. So we use it to look back. We call it the Gothic Constitution. And it's this period. So we start to get things like gargoyles and abbeys being referred to as Gothic. And if you hear people talk about Gothic architecture, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. So it means bad art, it means medieval, but it still means barbaric. Those two, te two terms become interlinked. It's Gothic because it's barbaric, it's barbaric because it's bad art. And this is where we start to get the death, the darkness, the skulls. This is the kind of thing that we perhaps think of, the imagery that comes to mind. You've got things like Dan's Macaba, uh, Memento Mori, um, the kind of things that we get um, decorating crypts, those fantastic um, sculptures that we get on top of burial sites. This all becomes Gothic because it's a part of that medieval. So this is where you start to get uh, something that's a big part of modern Gothic. You know, the schools, the, the, the very dark um, aesthetic. This is where this is all coming from. You can see that this term is evolving and evolving over time. So where do we get to in the 18th century? So this is where the Gothic as we know it in many ways is born. Now, as I mentioned, in the early 18th century, the Gothic was referred to something that was bad art. We then get a gentleman called Richard Hurd. He was a very popular thinker who wrote a lot of moral and political treaties, and he actually was not particularly fond of the Gothic to start with. He thought it was just as bad as everybody else did. However, in 1764, he wrote a piece called Letters on Chivalry and Romance, and in that he actually said, Gothic's not that bad. You know, yes, there's giants, but they represent feudal lords, and yes, there's these chivalric knight errants, but they represent a time uh, gone by, and they also represent a way in which we can talk about our society. The Gothic, in Herd's eyes, is a perfect analogy. It's a way in which we can express our anxieties, it's a way in which we can discuss society's problems, and we can perhaps even come up with um, ways in which to solve them through the Gothic. And this is where the Gothic novel comes from. Whether or not Horace Walpole, the father of the Gothic novel, actually liked Herd's work is dead with him, really. <laughs> his letters uh, and his introductions to his novels leave us kind of in the dark, but certainly um, this is where this is coming from. The Gothic is an analogy. And the 18th century Gothic novel, some of these examples we've got here, use ancient settings. They're usually set in Europe or 
They're set in Scotland, they're often Catholic, and they use these settings to discuss the, the anxieties of the day. Uh, some of the big names here, we've got Clara Reeve and Radcliffe, who we at the centre are very big fans of. We do a lot of work. If you're interested in Anne Radcliffe, then Sheffield Gothic uh, is the group for you. And Matthew Lewis's The Monk, which was the text that really started to bring the taboo in. Gothic had always dealt with the taboo because it was using this setting and this ancient setting and magic and the supernatural to deal with contemporary problems, but usually they were prevented or subverted. It was either whatever was behind the black veil was in fact a skeleton and nothing supernatural, or it was just a portrait. The ghost was not a ghost. In Matthew Lewis's The Monk, all of those taboos become realized. And this is where the Gothic starts to really become this, um, I don't want to overuse the word subversive, but the subversive form. And a lot of the contemporary Gothic texts, I think, can really trace their origins back to Matthew Lewis. We then move into the 19th century, some texts that you've probably all heard of. And for a lot of you, this is probably what you think about when you think of Gothic. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, uh, Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and of course, Bram Stoker's Dracula. So the Gothic could be used both as a way of presenting the other as a dangerous and dark, different to us sort of image, something that we had to avoid, something that we had to, to, to kind of step past or it could also be used as a way and this is what a lot of contemporary gothic does and we'll come to this to explore something different and suggest that actually we should be doing something different and then we get to contemporary gothic culture so this is the kind of thing that you might have seen um, my colleague made this uh, powerpoint and she's a big south park fan which is why you've got this fantastic episode but it's actually a really interesting episode You've got the goth weekend in Whitby, you've got fashion, you've got music, you have a subculture. It's gothic and it's not gothic. These two things are interlinked but not mutually exclusive. So the gothic is all things. We joke at Sheffield Gothic uh, that everything is gothic. We always ask the question, but is it gothic? And the answer is always yes. <laughs> and then we've got some contemporary texts here. You can see that there's a trend now in Gothic publishing for black and red. <laughs> so why is the Gothic important? Why do we study it? Well, for lots of different reasons and too many for me to go into right now. But the Gothic, as I mentioned, is at its heart an analogy. It's a way in which we can use a setting, a form of literature, of art, of music, even of fashion and social expression to explore our anxieties about gender, about identity, about nationality, about sexuality. It is all of these things and none of these things, depending on what you want to do with it. This is why the monster, the double, the vampire, the werewolf, whatever it is, there's a way in which we use it to express something about our contemporary setting. So from an academic standpoint, to look back through the Gothic is a very valuable practice. By looking back through the lens of the Gothic, by taking apart these writers and what their anxieties were, we can learn a lot about these different points in time. And we can also track a change. The Gothic evolves every 10, 20 years, sometimes every year, depending on what's happening. The Gothic shifts and changes. It is everything and nothing all at once. So by seeing how it changes, how it shifts, we can learn a lot about society. And that's why we should study the Gothic. And we do, and we do lots of things. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, we hold lots of different events at the center. We have networking days, we run a blog. Uh, if you search for Sheffield Gothic Reading Group, we're the first thing that comes up. Uh, and we also have an event called Reimagine the Gothic. Um, it's the 12th to 13th of May. Uh, for anyone in education or recently le left education, it's free to attend, two-day conference. But we also have a creative showcase, which takes place on the Saturday from three o'clock. There'll be short films, artwork, photography. Uh, we're using creative and interdisciplinary methods to rethink and reimagine the Gothic. And this year's theme is Gothic Spaces. So if you would like to know more, you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook, pretty much on any social media. We get around. Just drop us a message. Thank you.